Massachusetts, Mark from the United States. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Mark from the States. How are we doing today? I am doing fantastic. I hope you are as well. Thank you so much for coming today. We want to watch The Great Escape from Stalag 3. It is from History Chap. Uh, so Chris Green over there at History Chap uh, has uh, emailed me. And uh, so we've talked. And uh, as far as I know, he is okay with us watching the, his videos and learning from him. He's a historian. The guy knows what he's talking about. And we've watched several already. And he, I just really enjoy his stuff. And so... Going forward, uh, I think I'm just going to start uh, just to watch videos of the, of the people that I've actually physically talked to, and that's vlogging through history, Yarn Hub, of course, Chris, and, and I'm waiting to hear back from a few others. And uh, until the strikes go away. and uh, But even then, I want to be able to freely, knowing that... It, it's a bless, you know, it's been okayed by the original content creator. And so please support their channels. I'm always going to encourage you to watch their videos first and like, subscribe to their channels, help them. Because without them, we have nothing to learn from. And it's important that uh, I'm not here to make the money. It's them who are here. Uh, who are doing these wonderful videos for us to learn from. So please go to their channel and uh, like and comment and do all the things that help their channel. And then you can come back and watch this with me. And if you've already seen the video on their channel and you're coming to watch this, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm toying with the idea of starting to delete some of the uh, videos that I have on the channel just because you just don't know where these are going to come from. I mean, apparently they get notified right away that the video has been uploaded, so then they have the choice of what you're doing. Well, my latest strike was from a video five months ago, so he'd known I'd uploaded his video uh, five months ago and just now has been hit with the strike so yeah it's crazy it's like the wild west out here you just don't know where it's going to come or when it's going to come but anyway let's get into this video great escape come sit on this big fake couch um no cats today uh no sun today i'm gonna try to get him to come back that was a lot of fun and uh yeah let's do this during World War II, over 170,000 British prisoners of war were captured by the Germans and Italians. Many tried to escape, but less than 1% made it home. On the night of the 24th, 25th of March, 1944, 76 Allied prisoners of war escaped from Stalag Luft III in Eastern Germany. It was immortalized in the 1963 film, The Great Escape, starring amongst others, Steve McQueen, who tries to reach freedom in an epic motorcycle chase. Just how close to reality was the film? Well, this is the true story of The Great Escape. During the Second World War, each section of the German armed forces was responsible for guarding the captured, their captured counterparts. So, uh, Henstalag Luft III was, captured, was for captured pilots and aircrew and was run by the Luftwaffe. Situated near Sargon in Silesia, Eastern Germany, which is now part of Poland, Stalag Luft III was opened in September 1942. 100 miles southeast of Berlin, it housed somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 prisoners of war. Dang, almost all of whom, but not exclusively, were pilots or aircrew. The camp was actually divided into five compounds, which were sort of self-contained compounds. Two of the compounds, south and west, housed US air crews, whilst North Compound, housing an assortment of British, Commonwealth and European officers, was the site of the Great Escape. Stalag Luft III was one of the camps where persistent offenders would be sent. You know, as prisoners who, uh, who basically enjoyed escaping and causing trouble for the German authorities. 
The chances of escaping from this camp in the far east of Germany and making it across Nazi-controlled Europe to neutral territory was, as the Germans thought, nigh on impossible. Inside the camp, to relieve the monotony of their incarceration, the prisoners in North Compound established a theatre, they had a radio station, they had two newspapers. One of the prisoners in there was Tim Mundy, who in civilian life had been a master at King's College. Captured at the fall of Calais in 1940, Mundy was part of a team delivering regular lectures and courses and examinations to keep the prisoners' grey matter working. Some prisoners uh. actually earned degrees whilst they were prisoners of war. Wow, okay. There had been mass escapes by Allied prisoners earlier in World War II. During the previous year, 1943, uh, 43 British officers had broken out of a camp also in Poland. And there had also been breakouts by large groups of Polish and French officers too. This escape, the Great Escape, was however on a different scale. The breakout was masterminded by squadron leader Roger Bushell. This South African-born British officer had been a promising lawyer before the war and then had signed up to fly for the RAF. He was captured when his Spitfire was shot down during the Dunkirk evacuation. By the time he arrived in Stalag Luft III, uh, Bushel had developed a reputation for escaping. <laughs> his first attempt, he, he merely cut his way out of the wire, perimeter wire at his camp, uh, and was uh, nearly got a home run. He was arrested trying to cross the border into neutral Switzerland. When he next escaped, he spent nearly eight months on the run, hiding out in Prague before being betrayed. So oh, Bushel's arrival at Stalag Luft III stirred the prisoners. After all, the reason that many of them were in this particular camp was because they too enjoyed causing the, the Germans grief by escaping and generally being a pain in the backside. Indeed, it was British officers in the eastern compound of this very camp in October 1943 who had escaped by digging a tunnel under a gymnastic vaulting horse. The three prisoners, uh, Michael Codner, Eric Williams and Oliver Philpot, escaped and all three of them made it back to Britain. The story of their escape was made into a film in 1950 called The Wooden Horse. Huh. Meanwhile, in the North Compound, Bushel was masterminding something bigger, much bigger, a mass breakout by 200 prisoners of war. Damn. Three escape tunnels were dug simultaneously uh, named Tom, Dick and Harry. The entrances to these tunnels were incredibly well camouflaged. Harry, for instance, started under a stove in Hut 104, and the stove was kept on permanently so the German guards wouldn't get too close because it was a bit too hot. Meanwhile, Dick was actually uh, beneath a drain sump in the washrooms. In September 1943, however, a month before the wooden horse escape in the other compound, the Germans discovered, uh, German guards discovered the third tunnel, Tom. It was the 98th tunnel that the German guards uncovered in this particular prison camp, which says, I think, something about the particular band of prisoners they were trying to control. <laughs> the Germans were wise to the character of their prisoners, and Stalag Luft III had extra security measures in place to deter the would-be escapees. The huts were all raised 60 centimetres, up, uh, 24 inches, off the ground to make, uh, to make tunnels more visible to the guards. Seismic microphones were placed on the fences, whose purpose was to detect uh, the sounds of digging below. Okay. Apart from the security measures and the vigilance of the guards, the biggest problem when digging the tunnels was actually, for the prisoners, was actually they were digging through sandy subsoil. And firstly, you know, this made construction of the tunnels extremely hard, as without, you know, suitable propping, they would just collapse. Any of you who've tried to dig little tunnels with your kids, or when you were kids, at the seaside in the sand, will know just what I'm talking about. 600 prisoners were involved in the escape project, with the digging being entrusted to nearly 150 Canadians, wow. many of whom were chosen specifically because of their former mining experience. For nine months, the teams dug on Tunnel Harry, 30 feet beneath the surface through that sandy soil, Very sometimes nice. working in spaces just two foot square, often working naked to prevent their clothes being totally ruined by the yellow sand. I would be freaking out having to go that deep and I just well again it's just takes a unique individual to be able to work down there and you know dig and just not claustrophobic at all and the threat of that thing just collapsing on you just freaks me out and he mentioned these guys these Aussies are were minors so they're used to this sort of thing and obviously giving the game away to the Germans up above as well 
they managed to engineer a tunnel that was 111 yards long. <laughs> okay, so I just want to put into context for you what this feat of engineering with rudimentary uh, implements actually entailed. So they went down 30 feet. Well, if we just come over towards the, uh, the lamppost here, there is seven feet. We're talking um, f just over four times that height, which takes us to way above the lamppost. So four times that height, and if we're talking of uh, 111 yards, we're actually talking from where I'm standing now to, well, you can see the, um, the green trees right at the end. That's 111 yards away. That is what they dug. So they went down 30 feet, and then they went all that distance oh, with I rudimentary tools, you and they achieved visual. all of that in nine painstaking months, which I think, and maybe wow. you do too, is pretty impressive. Over 4,000 boards were removed from beds to help shore up the tunnels as were 62 tables, 34 chairs, 76 benches, 635 mattresses, and 1,700 know? blankets were they also commandeered to help muffle the sound of the digging. And the miners, they created digging tools out of normal utensils, which they fashioned into digging utensils. So it's something like 1,200 knives, 500 spoons, 500 forks. Bribing the guards with contraband from their Red Cross parcels they were even able to obtain 30 shovels and oh 600 feet of rope. Some of that rope was used to haul trolleys backwards and forwards along the tunnel, ferrying men and equipment from one end to the other. Mutton fat, lamb fat, from the greasy soup that the prisoners were served was skimmed off and moulded into candles, the wicks of which were fashioned from pyjama cords. Ventilation shafts were created using uh, powdered milk uh, tins, uh, called klim tins, and squadron leader Bob Nelson designed a pump to push air along the whole length of the tunnel, uh, made from parts of uh, beds, hockey sticks, knapsacks, and the famous klim tins again. So as I said, the first challenge was actually tunneling through the sand, but the second challenge was actually disposing of it. Whereas the sand was yellow, the topsoil in the camp was dark. So any sand being dumped on the surface would look really obvious to the guards. Ingeniously, the prisoners would tie the bottom of their trousers with cord, and then they'd fill their trousers with sand. And then they would enter the compound, and whilst they uh, pretended to chat to fellow prisoners, they would untie those cords and release the sand, and they, they, the comrades they, they were talking to would sort of casually just mix the sand with their feet into the, into the topsoil and pretend they were just having a conversation. Eventually, the pace of the digging meant that this ingenious but painfully slow process was superseded by uh, dropping sand beneath the seating in the theatre, and then by finally closing down Tunnel Dick and filling it with sand from Harry. All in all, nearly 100 tonnes of sand were removed from Tunnel Harry alone. As the tunnel reached the perimeter fence, they were starting to get worried that those, those seismic microphones were going to pick up the sound of digging. So the prisoners formed a choir led by uh, Johnny Dodge, uh, and they used to practice their singing right by the fence, just above where they were digging, uh, to ruin uh, the, uh, the, the, the detection skills of the microphones. The Germans were no fools. They were aware that something was up, but they just couldn't find the entrances to either tunnels Dick or Harry. However, they did decide to move 19 of their top suspects out of the camp to other camps. But little did they know that out of those 19, only six were actually involved in this audacious uh, escape plan. With the Gestapo now taking a vigilant role in the camp, the decision was made to bring forward the escape from the warm summer months to the 24th of March. Uh, again, in the film, you know, it shows the German countryside off in its beautiful summer technicolor. But the reality was that the, uh, that March 1944 was the coldest in that part of Poland for 30 years. On the night of the 24th of March, 1944, 200 prisoners were filed, brought in to Hut 104. They'd have been given false papers, local currency, uh, and civilian clothing, often fashioned from military uniforms that had been dyed and altered, or indeed uh, civilian clothing that they had bribed the guards for. And there they waited in Hut 104 for their number to be called, one through to 200. The first 100 would-be escapees were those who were called serial offenders. In other words, men who had escaped before. People like Roger Bushell himself. And also in this opening 100 were the fluent German speakers. You know, this group, this opening 100, with their experience of escaping and also their language skills, were considered the most likely to make that fabled home run back to Britain. 
The second 100 uh, were drawn by lots, and these men were urged to travel by night and keep clear of towns, so as to avoid not being able to speak German. If you're enjoying this story, then please click the like button below, and also subscribe to hear more stories in the future. In the film, uh, The Great Escape, uh, Steve McQueen uh, takes a central role as an American prisoner heavily involved in the escape. In truth, whilst there were US Air Force prisoners at the camp, there were none in North Compound. So I'm really sorry all my American viewers, but there were no Americans in The Real Great Escape. But don't turn off, please, because this is a great story nevertheless. And here's a great one for you. <laughs> a British officer, Johnny Dodge, the man who had organised the choir, singing by the fence, he was actually American born. Born in America to American parents, when he was youngster, his parents divorced, uh, and his mother married a cousin of Winston Churchill. In 1914, at the outbreak of the First World War, Dodge travelled from, uh, fr uh, from America to Britain. He enlisted in the British Army, and a year later, he swapped his American nationality for his adopted country that he was now fighting for. In that same year, he was de decorated at Gallipoli. And whilst in that theatre of war over in the Eastern Mediterranean, he was one of a party of four who chose the burial site for the poet Rupert Brooke. He finished the war serving on the Western Front where he was awarded the Distinguished Service Order, the DSO. When the Second World War started, Dodge once again enlisted. This time he was given the rank of Major in the Middlesex Regiment and he was attached to the 51st Highland Infantry Division in France. When his division was engulfed by the Nazi Blitzkrieg in 1940, he refused to surrender and he attempted to swim to some ships he could see in the English Channel on the horizon in the English Channel, but he was unable to reach them. He returned to shore having swum a round trip of nearly seven miles where he was captured. And as I said, it was Dodge who was approaching his 50th birthday who'd organized those choir practices near the perimeter fence. So I'm just going to go ahead and say an American was involved, even though he he uh, chose to uh, accept his British uh, citizenship. That's fine. And I'm totally cool with that. I know. But for a movie in America, that's going to be successful. It's got to involve an American. It's just how it is. I mean, it happens all over the world. Whoever makes the movies, right? You, you, you can't. Unless it's specifically important to the story, um, the, the, they'll change characters all the time. And it's still done today. Uh, in some cases, egregiously, where they literally change the gender of the actual person. So uh, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, the story still is the same, but uh, the movie's good. Um, I'll have to watch it again. But yeah, I'm still going to say he's American. Come on. His parents were American. Come on. Here in, St uh, in, in Stalingrad, dry. So, American born, but officially now British. Nevertheless, go. actually, it was a real international escape involving prisoners from over a dozen countries, uh, only half of whom were British. There were, there were nine Canadians, there were six Poles, there were five Australians, uh, there were some South Africans, uh, there were Norwegians, Czechs, there was, a, there was one Greek, uh, and even a Rhodesian or Zimbabwean. Wow. Despite his age, Johnny Dodge wasn't the oldest escapee either. That, uh, that honour fell to Flight Lieutenant Bernard Pop Green, aged 56. He too was a First World War veteran and survivor of the Battles of the Somme and Passchendaele. Wow. And he had volunteered for the RAF this time round. But his plane had been shot down close to occupied Denmark in 1940. Meanwhile, the youngest escapee was just 21, Flight Lieutenant Tony Bethel. Actually, the average age of the prisoners of war who escaped on that night was somewhere around 26, 27, somewhat younger than the actors who played the characters <laughs> in the film. From the very outset of that evening, things started to go wrong. The ground was so cold, the men couldn't open the hatch, the door to the tunnel. It took them nearly an hour. And then the camp went into a blackout as bo Allied bombers flew a mission overhead. But worse was to come. When they finally broke surface at the end of the tunnel, the escapees found that instead of being inside the woods, they were 20 feet short. Uh. Now they would have to wait intervals between the guards doing their rounds and the searchlights sweeping the open ground. The plan was initially that they would have one prisoner exiting the tunnel every minute. Now that was reduced to 10 men every hour. With the clock ticking down and already two hours behind schedule, 
The second 100 were told to stand down. Tonight wasn't going to be their night. The heat from the tunnel was actually creating a small column of steam at the mouth of the tunnel. Uh, it was actually amazing under those circumstances that the tunnel wasn't actually spotted sooner. Right. But just before 5 a.m., the 77th man climbed the 30-foot ladder in the dark and emerged into the cold night and was spotted by the guards. Shots rang out. Squadron leader uh, Leonard Harry Trench, a New Zealander who had been shot down on a raid near Amsterdam, for which he was later to be awarded the Victoria Cross, raised his hands in surrender. It was all over. Pandemonium broke out in the camp. Guards shouting, dogs barking, whistles blowing. The guards had foiled a breakout, but they didn't know where the tunnel had started, nor did they know how many men had escaped. A thorough search began of all the huts. As luck would have it, a Hut 104 was one of the last to, uh, to be searched, enabling the prisoners to burn all their false papers <laughs> in the stove. And even when the hut was searched, the guards couldn't op locate the opening. It was only when a German uh, entered the tunnel from the exit and crawled all the way along uh, and started to bang on the oven that uh, the opening was discovered by the guards. Oh, jeez. Meanwhile, the prisoners were told to fall in for a head count on the parade ground. In an effort to thwart the count uh, and co cause confusion, the prisoners kept, kept moving and bobbing about and changing <laughs> lines until eventually the camp commandant threatened to personally shoot the next prisoner who did that. And as the head count was completed, the commandant realised that 76 of his prisoners were missing from his camp. It was the largest breakout of Allied aircrew in the whole war. Breaking out of the camp was a feat in itself, but now they were outside in what I said earlier was the coldest yeah. winter in this part of Poland for 30 years. And they were now having to make their way across Nazi Europe to safety. Like in fact, it was so cold and so bleak that some of the Canadians joked that it was like being back in Canada. The men peeled away into different directions, some on foot, some hoping to catch trains at local railway stations. Jimmy Jones, with the only Greek officer to escape, uh, planned to head down the River Danube to, and sort of veer off then towards Greece, uh, find some friendly faces, and then somehow move on to neutral uh, Turkey. Others, like Roger Bushell, headed west towards France. 26-year-old Tom Kirby Green chose a route south into Czechoslovakia, and then they were going to veer west through Austria to the safety of neutral Switzerland. He was accompanied by Canadian Gordon Kidder, a 27-year-old gifted linguist who had turned down the offer to study for a master's degree in German at John Hopkins University in Baltimore. The youngest escapee, Tony Bethel, started walking along the railway track with another prisoner, Les Long, in the hope of jumping on a train and somehow heading towards the north, towards the Baltic ports, where they could jump on a ship heading towards neutral Sweden. When Adolf Hitler heard about the breakout on the 26th of March, he flew into a rage, ordering that all escapees captured should be executed. Hermann Göring managed to convince him that that was too drastic, and in the end, Hitler decided that only 50 captured POWs would be executed. The decision Still, as to who would be executed and who would be saved fell to SS General Arthur Niebuhr a man who, quite frankly, was not squeamish and had played a prominent role in ethnic cleansing in both Poland and in the uh, Soviet Union. Asshole. It was estimated that 100,000 German troops were involved in the manhunt to find the missing uh, prisoners. Whilst this was a, an inconvenience for the Germans, the men assigned for the searches were not from the front lines. They haven't been drawn from Normandy or the, the Russian front. Uh, they were reservists. So it, it was debatable just how big an impact the escape had on the German war effort. But even if one prisoner got back to on a home run, it would be a brilliant propaganda coup. But that bitter winter weather was forcing those on foot to seek shelter in houses and, and the like, the sort of obvious places where the Germans would look for them. Yeah. And many were quickly rounded up, including two prisoners of war who actually knocked on a door of a remote cottage only for it to be opened by four German soldiers inside. 22-year-old Dennis Cochran wow. kept going, managing to cover a fantastic 550 miles in seven days. Shot down over the English Channel back in 1940, this fluent German speaker made it all, way, all the way to the Swiss frontier. And it was there, at the very last hurdle, that the Nazi border guards became suspicious of his identity papers. Uh. Little did Cochran know that the Germans had changed the layout of their passes 
in the days since his escape. Roger Bushell, traveling with a French officer, reached the, the German-French border within 24 hours of breaking out. And it was here at Saarbrücken railway station that a German guard supposedly said good luck in English, to which one of the escapees, probably Bushell, responded thank you in English, and they were captured. In the film The Great Escape, the prisoners were executed en masse. Oh, God. In reality, they were actually executed in dribs and drabs. Roger Bushell and his French companion were being transported in a Gestapo car when it pulled over near the town of Ramstein, and they were told to get out and stretch their legs because it was a long journey. Gestapo officer Emil Schulz then shot both men in the back of the head. Oh, God. Tom Kirby Green and Gordon Kidder were captured near the Austrian-Swiss border. Both men were shot by the Gestapo. Kirby Green leaving a wife and small boy back in England. Oh. Tony Bethel, the youngest escapee, and Les Long were picked up trying to walk along the railway line in broad daylight. Bethel was taken back to camp where he spent his 22nd birthday in solitary confinement. Long was executed. In total, 50 recaptured prisoners of war from 13 countries were executed in cold blood. Amongst those who were spared was Johnny Dodge. It seems that his distant relationship to Churchill may have worried even the Gestapo. Oh, wow. Also spared was Dick Churchill. He had been captured hiding in a hayloft and he was to go on to be the, the, the oldest survivor of the Great Escape. In 2014, he gave an interview where he indicated that he thought that his surname had frightened his would-be executioners as well, although he actually wasn't, re he wasn't related to Winston Churchill whatsoever. Uh. Equally, Flight Lieutenant Bob Nelson, you know, the man who had designed the, the air pump for the tunnel, he was spared because the Germans mistakenly thought that he was a descendant of Britain's great na naval hero, uh. Admiral <laughs> Lord Horatio yeah. Nelson. Despite the heartache of capture and the wow. execution of 50 of the men, Amazingly, three managed to make the fabled home run, reaching the safety of Great Britain. Really? And none of them were British. Two 26-year-old Norwegians, Jens Müller and Per Bergsland, uh, numbers uh, 43 and 44 in the line in the tunnel, managed to make, uh, take a train to Stettin on the, uh, the Baltic coast. And from there, they smuggled their way onto a ship heading to neutral Sweden. Bram van der Stock, wow. a, uh, a Dutch flying ace with six confirmed flying kills with the RAF back at the beginning of the war, travelled via trains back to his native Netherlands where he made contact with the underground resistance. They smuggled him to resistance fighters in Belgium, who in turn moved him on to fellow resistance operators in France. And finally, he was spirited across the Pyrenees into neutral but fascist Spain. And then he made his way to the British territory at Gibraltar, Gibraltar. on the 8th yeah. of July, 1944, cool. just under three months after the Great Escape. Uh, van der Stock was to go back into action before the end of the war, and later he became a doctor in the United States and died in 1993. Wow. The British government were informed of the executions via the Swiss authorities in the May, 1944. By coincidence, the senior officer at Stalag Luft III, uh, Group Captain Herbert Massey, was repatriated about this same time due to ill health. So he was brought back to Britain and he was able to confirm the stories that had been passed on by the Swiss and add further details, not least the names of some of the prisoners who had been executed. Uh. Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden informed the House of the Commons of this cold-blooded act and pledged that those responsible would be hunted down. And so they were. At the end of the war, the British launched a manhunt to track down those involved in the executions. The officer in charge was a former policeman from Blackpool, Frank McKenna. His small team doggedly hunted down 18 former Gestapo officers and brought them to trial. SS General Arthur Niebuhr, the man who had decided who would live and who would die, evaded Allied justice, having been executed by the Nazis themselves after being implicated in the July plot to assassinate Hitler. Well, that's Nevertheless, a turn of events. All 18 brought to trial by McKenna were found guilty. Five were given prison sentences ranging from 10 years to life. 13 were sentenced to death, including Emil Schultz. The man who had executed Roger Bushel and his French companion was himself executed by hanging in February 1948. Of the 170,000 British prisoners of war captured by the Germans and Italians during World War II, only 1,200, less than 1%, managed to successfully escape and return to Britain. 
Amongst them were three of the escapees of the Great Escape. A memorial was erected Very by cool. the uh, POWs in the camp to their fallen comrades, the 50 men executed in cold blood by the Gestapo. And it's still there in Poland to this day. The silent, tragic reminder to those 50 men who never made it home from the Great Escape. Wow. Yeah, very cool. Uh, thank you so much for uh, watching this with me. The, Chris does a great job. I, I enjoy his storytelling because history is is that it's stories and uh, and I just I enjoy the way he tells and narrates his uh, these historical moments. It's just uh, incredible. Um, I'd forgotten honestly. I'd forgotten that that so many of them were executed because of escaping. And Hitler's such a jerk. Uh, God. So, anywho, not, I don't care about that, dude. But um, <clears throat> kudos to those guys that actually did that. That just, it's so painstakingly slow of a process to have to dig, you know, through the soil like that and, and all the things they had to think of. And then hearing about that one guy, <clears throat> I forget his name, he got all the way to the Swiss border and they found out, that uh, those papers he had was false. And how crazy is it that the guy says, the German says, you know, good luck to, so, and he says, thank you. And that's how they got caught. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, so close. So close for a lot of those guys. But it's good to see some some were able to do it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I, I love, of course, it's such a great movie. Um, I'm going to say that that guy is American Dodge. I mean, for all intents and purposes, he literally has American parents, was born in America. If you don't want to say you're American, that's cool. But for the, for just for the, for the, the movie to have some sort of connection with all, you know, um, but very good, very good. Um, good deal. So what do you guys think? I'd like to know. Um, please support Chris. We, we mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, support the History Chap. Please go to his channel. Watch a lot of his other videos. Uh, like, subscribe if you haven't. Um, it's, it, it certainly is worth subscribing. He's just, uh, he's enjoyable. And you do learn a lot. And yeah, I mean, what more could you ask for? So go do that then come back and watch us. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much. Hope everybody's happy, healthy, and safe. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Take care. Bye. Mark from the States. Mark from the States. It's Mark. Yeah.